In this lecture, we'll continue talking about topics regarding the consistency of the ordinary least square estimator. Let's review what we have done so far. We have introduced the linear regression equation, and we have introduced the ordinary least square estimator for the coefficients in this equation. And we show the ordinary least square estimator is consistent for the parameters in the linear regression equation if the following assumptions are satisfied. Uh, the assumptions that we introduced include these four assumptions. Orthogonality, which says that the error term is orthogonal to all the regressors, all the x variables, including the constant variable. And the second assumption is that the data is an IID sample from the population that we are interested in. That is uh, the yi x one i to x k i for each i is an ind independent and identically distributed draw from the distribution of this population random variables. And the third assumption is regarding the fourth moment of the random variables involved. We require that uh, the fourth moment of the variables are finite. So that is also named as large outliers are unlikely. So the random variables um, do not have uh, a high probability of having large outliers. And the fourth assumption is no perfect multicollinearity, uh, which says that none of the variable is a perfect linear combination of the other variables, including the constant term, if it is uh, it, it, if the constant term is included. Um, that is equivalent to saying that this matrix is invertible. Under these four assumptions, orthogonality, IID, and finite kurtosis, and no perfect multicollinearity, we show that the ordinary least square estimator for the beta vector is consistent. That is, it converges in probability to the beta vector. So that implies the ordinary least square estimator converges in probability to the true value of the parameter. Now, I want to talk about a related concept, a related property to consistency. So ordinary least square estimator is um, not only consistent, but also unbiased. Unbiased, um, as we have learned in the first part of the course, it means that in expectation, it is equal to the true value. So expectation of the estimator equals to the true value. Here, the definition of unbiasedness is the same. Um, and the ordinary least square estimator is unbiased and they're very similar assumptions as the ones we assumed for consistency. So a slightly different, but very similar set of assumptions can guarantee unbiasedness. Let's now go over unbiasedness and the assumptions required for them. So as I said, unbiasedness means expectation of the random variable or expectation of the estimator equals the true value it is trying to estimate. So if this holds then beta, hat vector is an unbiased estimator of the beta vector. So how do you interpret unbiasedness? Um, so from a frequentist point of view, unbiasedness means the following, means that if a billion or very large number of researchers are trying to estimate the same thing, and they each draw a different sample from the same population, and they each calculate this estimator, then their average should be the same as the true value. So they should be on average correct. They should be on, on average correct. 
Uh, roughly speaking, an unbiased estimator has no tendency to be too large or small or too small. So there is no reason to believe that the estimator is too large or too small. So that's what unbiasedness means. Um, and what are the conditions we impose to ensure unbiasedness? The, the conditions um, <clears throat> are actually very similar to the ones we require for um, consistency. Remember for consistency, the first assumption we require was orthogonality. We want the error term to be orthogonal to the X variables and including the constant variable. Here for unbiasedness, we want something stronger. So this assumption is slightly stronger than orthogonality. And this is the counterpart of that assumption, but it's slightly stronger. We require u, the error term, to be mean independent of the x random variables. So u is mean independent of the x variables. Uh, so the first assumption we require is mean independence instead of orthogonality. So <clears throat> the orthogonality condition is in the terminology of uh, the first half, the week five um, lecture uh, is linear independence. And also in week five's lecture, we talked about how mean independence implies linear independence. So that's why we can say this mean independence assumption is uh, stronger. It implies uh, the orthogonality condition that we assume for consistency. So unbiasedness uh, requires uh, a stronger independence assumption between the error and the X variables. Um, but like the consistency, we also want to uh, assume that the data, the data is an IID sample from the population we are interested in. Interestingly, unbiasedness does not require the finite kurtosis assumption. So this one can be crossed out. Um, but unbiasedness still requires no perfect multicollinearity. But that's not surprising because we know when, when there is perfect multicollinearity, the ordinary least square estimator is not well defined. So that creates problem for both consistency and unbiasedness. <clears throat> Here, um, this, the mathematical statement for no perfect, no perfect multicollinearity here is slightly different than that for the uh, consistency of the estimator. So here we want the sample average instead of the population expectation. So we want the sample average instead of the population expectation of this matrix to be invertible. Um, so that's but uh, that uh, the difference is just some techni technicality. It's not of uh, any practical importance. The reason that uh, this is this condition is slightly different is because unbiasedness is a property that we show to hold at any given sample size n. We're not taking n to infinity when we argue for unbiasedness. So we have to focus on the finite n version of this matrix. Well, for consistency, um, we, the argument is about what happens when we take n to infinity. So th that's why there we care more about the limit, what happens when n goes to infinity. And the limit of that, this matrix is the expectation. So that's why in the consistency um, proof, in the conditions that guarantee consistency, we state the no perfect multicollinearity condition in terms of the expectation. Well, here for unbiasedness, we state it in terms of the sample average. Um, but the difference is not super important. Uh, the, Meaningful differences in here for unbiasedness, we require this stronger independence assumption between the error term and the X. And we do not need the finite kurtosis 
condition. Uh, the reason that we do not need the finite kurtosis condition is because we are not taking n to infinity. Therefore, we're not applying law of large number. That's why we do not need this one. <clears throat> All right, so um, now just to put everything together, these are the three assumptions that can guarantee unbiasedness of the ordinarily square estimator. So mean independence, IID sample, and no perfect multicollinearity. Under these three assumptions, um, the ordinarily square estimator is unbiased. We state this without a proof. The proof is not super difficult, but it doesn't help our understanding of the model. So I'm not going to go over the proof for you. And it's certainly uh, the proof is not required for any exam or problem sets. So that's the unbiasedness of ordinarily square estimators. It is guaranteed under a set of very similar conditions as those that guarantee consistency. So ordinarily square estimators has good properties if these assumptions are satisfied. Now, next, um, I will talk about two special topics in descriptive regression that's related to consistency of ordinarily square estimators. Uh, so the topics are um, related to consistency, but the focus of the topic is actually regarding how we interpret descriptive, uh, dis dis sorry, how we interpret descriptive regression, how we interpret um, the coefficients in the, in the descriptive model and how we use descriptive model to answer some questions. So first I'm going to start with predicting expected outcome. How do we predict expected outcome? Uh, and then the second topic would be about misspecification in the conditional mean model. <clears throat> Let's start with predicting expected outcome. Predicting expected outcome is an important purpose of conditional mean model. It's an important use of conditional mean model. Um, so this, an important use of the conditional mean model is to predict expected outcome for given subgroups of the population, okay? Um, now let let me first uh, start with the general formula for the conditional mean model. Uh, the conditional mean model that we talked about is this linear conditional mean model, which assumes that the conditional mean of y given the x random variables is this linear function of the linear random variables, okay, of the linear x variables. Suppose that we are interested in, we are interested in, so we assume that the conditional mean of y given the x variables are linear in the x variables. And suppose that we are interested in the expected y for individuals with a given set of values for the x variables. I will give you some examples of this. Then what is the expected y given individual, uh, what is the expected y for individuals with this given value of the x variables? Well, clearly that should be expected value of y given x1 equals little x1, to uh, xk equals little xk. And that, according to our, our assumption about the conditional mean model, that should be equal to this, to beta zero plus beta one little x one plus da 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 plus beta k xk. So simply plug in the little x values for these uh, capital X variables. So that is the expected y for individuals with 
um, x variables equals to these given values. So recall that we use capital letters to stand for random variables, or use this lowercase value uh, letters to stand for a realization or a value, a fixed value, um, a realization or a value for the random variable. Now, so you are interested in the expected y for individuals with x values equal to these realizations. Uh, so what you are interested in is this. And if you call that gamma, if you give that um, a, a name and call that gamma, you define gamma to be this quantity that you're interested in then gamma is your parameter of interest. And that parameter of interest is unknown because even though the little x values are given, because if you are interested in uh, say the average wage of women with 12 years of education, you know uh, that the gender value is women and the uh, education value is 12 years. Uh, but so the little x values are known uh, however, the beta values are unknown. Those are unknown parameters in the population model. Um, how do you estimate your parameter of interest gamma? Well, intuitively, uh, you can simply plug in estimators for the betas. Right? So notice that gamma is a function of the betas. It's in fact a continuous function of the betas. So if you plug in consistent estimators of betas and you call that gamma hat, you use that as the estimator for your parameter of interest gamma, then gamma hat should be consistent for gamma should convert in probability to gamma. As long as the beta estimators you plugged in were consistent, as long as the beta had converges to beta in probability. Uh, why is that? So this is by the Slutsky theorem. So that's by the Slutsky theorem. And the Slutsky theorem is applied on the function of gamma. Gamma is a function of a function of the betas of the whole beta vector. And that function is given by this, right? So it's given by, if you write it in, um, we don't have to write it in matrix form, but if you want to write it in matrix form, that's the inner product of beta vector and the little x vector. Where the x, these are just constants that we know, that we set when we define our parameter of interest. And so gamma is a function of G and it's a linear function of, sorry, it's a function of beta. It's a linear function of beta. So it's continuous in beta. Um, that if gamma is a continuous function of beta, if beta can be estimated by this beta hat consistently, then gamma can be estimated consistently by G of beta hat, which is exactly this. So the consistency of gamma hat follows from the Slutsky's theorem. All right, so that's the basics um, of predicting expected outcome and estimating the predicted expected outcome.
Now let's consider an example where we use this prediction to answer some interesting sort of interesting questions. Uh, let's study gender wage gap. A classic topic in labor economics is the gender wage gap. Um, that is how women and men are paid differently on average. And this is a topic of great political tension. Um, to see how it is a great political tension. So you can see this is um, a political poster, a political meme that was circulated in 2016. Um, this picture says that um, same work, different paycheck. Uh, President Obama is fighting for equal pay. So what this means is that the, the, the poster argues that men and women are doing the same work, but a woman is paid 77% of what the man was paid. So there is a 23% of gap between the woman's pay and the man's pay. So this is um, a poster by the people who believe that gender wage gap exists. Well, this is another political meme that argues that gender wage gap doesn't exist. What it says is if women are cheaper than men, why aren't, why aren't companies fire all the men and hiring only women? That way you reduce your wage costs and increase your profit. Why don't companies all do that if women are indeed cheaper than men? That is a good point. Uh, so clearly it's a very important topic. Uh, how do you measure that in the data? How do you measure gender wage gap in the data? Uh, first, let's set up the model. Uh, let Y denote the, say the hourly wage and that X1 be a dummy variable for female. So X1 equals one if the person is female and X1 is zero if the person is male. And let the population be the working population of the United States. So we are interested in the gender wage gap among all workers in the United States. So suppose we are just interested in the expected wage gap between genders. We can simply consider this conditional mean model. Um, that's, that relates the conditional mean of Y given gender to gender. That writes this conditional mean as a function, this linear function of gender. If we consider, we, if we assume this conditional mean model, we, we use this conditional mean model, um, then one of these coefficients will be the parameter that we are interested in, will be the expected wage gap. Uh, let's talk about that on the next slide. But uh, for now, let's also assume that um, our consistency assumptions A2, A3, and A4 hold. So IID assumption holds, uh, finite kurtosis holds, and no perfect multicolonarity holds. So suppose all of these holds, uh, then the OLS estimator of regressing Y on X1, including the constant, uh, will give us consistent estimators for beta zero and consistent estimator for beta one. Now let's first figure out what is the parameter that stands for gender wage gap. To do that, we start with, uh, we look at this conditional mean model and we ask what is the expected hourly wage for a man. The expected hourly wage for a man according to the model is expected hourly wage given that X1 equals zero. 
right? Because for men, x1 equals zero. So, and that would be beta zero. So that is the expected hourly wage for a man. Now, what about, um, and sorry, a consistent estimator of that parameter is beta zero hat, provided that A2, A3, A4 hold. Why don't I talk about A1? Because for the conditional mean model, A1 automatically is satisfied, right? If you define U to be Y minus EY given X1, then automatically e, U is um, mean independent of X and therefore is also orthogonal to X. Okay, so provided that A2, A3, A4 hold, then beta zero hand is a consistent estimator for the expected hourly wage for a man. Now, what is the expected hourly wage for a woman? And that would be EY given X1 equals one, because one is the value for X1 if the person is female. And then if you plug in one here, and you're gonna get beta zero plus beta one. So that is the expected hourly wage for a woman. And you can estimate that consistently using beta zero hat plus beta one hat where beta zero hat and beta one hat are the ordinary square estimators uh, from regressing y on x1. So a consistent estimator for it is beta zero hat plus beta one hat. Now, if the expected hourly wage for men is this expected hourly wage for a woman is this, then what's the gender wage gap? That would be the difference between the two, right? So the expected gender wage gap is the difference between the two. And that is clearly just uh, beta one. So beta one is uh, how much we expect a woman to earn how much less we expect a woman to earn relative to a man. And um, this is called the unconditional expected gender wage gap because we are not conditioning on any other characteristics of the person. We are simply comparing the expected wage for men and the expected wage for women. And clearly a consistent estimator for this expected gender wage gap would be beta hat, beta one hat. So the 77% or and 78%, depending on which year you're talking about, uh, is roughly an estimator for this quantity, for this unconditional expected gender wage gap. Now, in, if you look at the data and you will, if you look at US uh, wage data, you will find that this gap does exist. This gap is there. Women do earn less than men um, on average. But then again, why does the gap exist? Well, the pro-gender wage gap camp would just say that there must be discrimination. It must be that in workplace, women are not treated equally as uh, with men. Um, but not so fast. We also know that women and men do not receive the same education. They do not choose the same occupation and they probably also do not choose the same work schedule um, for whatever reason. Uh, more men choose to work full-time and more women choose to uh, work part-time. 
and so on and so forth. There are many differences between women and men other than their gender. So we, if you look at the data, you will see the gap, this gap, the, the, the unconditional gender wage gap is undeniably there, it's true. Uh, but does that mean female labor really is cheaper for companies, right? Um, so female labor would be considered cheaper if females are of the same, uh, say, quality and can do the same work but are still paid less, that would be um, saying female labor is really cheaper. Um, but there are reason to th think that maybe they are not doing the same work. To, maybe because they are not receiving the same education, they are not choosing the same occupation, and they are not choosing the same career. So we can um, try to dissect this, try to um, separate the uh, part of wage gap that's explained for all those differences and the wage gap explained only by gender, explained not by anything else, but only by gender. So we can separate those two um, types of gaps by using a more, a slightly more complicated conditional mean model. Um, to make things simple, let's say that there is only one other dimension, that's education. So other than gender, there is only one other dimension that people can differ from each other. Let's say it's education. And let's say X2 stands for education, which is measured by the years of schooling that the person received. Now assume that the conditional mean of Y given gender and schooling is linear in gender and schooling. That is an assumption. We'll talk about this assumption later. Assume that this is linear in X1 and X2. That means this linearity assumption means that there exist constants gamma zero, gamma one, gamma two, so that the conditional mean of y given x one, x two equals this linear function of x one and x two. So suppose that is the conditional mean model, that is the true conditional mean model then according to this model, what is the expected wage of a man with a given number of years of schooling, see x2 years of schooling, then it's, e so it's easy to find the, the answer to this question. Uh, we can um, just plug in the value for gender, which is zero for men, and plug in the value for schooling, which is little x2. So that expected wage is expected wage of y, expected y given x1 equals zero, x2 equals little x2. So basically you um, plug in zero here and you plug in little x2 here. And clearly you get gamma zero plus gamma two little x2. So gamma zero plus gamma two x2 is the expected wage of a man with little x2 years of schooling. Now, if you do the same thing for women, you plug in a different value for gender, plug in x1 equals one, but let's say because you want to see um, how men and women differ in expected wage when their schooling level is fixed at the same level. So you don't want to change the little x2 value, but you, you change the gender value from zero to one. When you change the gender value from zero to one, you plug in one here, you're still plugging little x2 here. So you get gamma zero plus gamma one plus gamma two little x2. So that is the expected wage of a woman with little x2 years of schooling. 
So that is gamma zero plus gamma one plus gamma two little x two. So if this is the expected wage of a man with little x two years of schooling, and this is the expected wage of a woman with little x two years of schooling, what is the gender wage gap among people with little x two years of schooling with the same level of schooling, say x two? Well, clearly you can just take the difference of the two and the difference is gamma one. So according to the conditional mean model that we assumed on the previous slide, the conditional expected gender wage gap given the year of schooling level is gamma one. And a consistent estimator for this conditional expected gender wage gap is simply gamma one hat. You can estimate gamma one consistently using the ordinary least square estimator on this conditional mean model, on this conditional mean model that we assumed. So what does that mean? You basically regress y on x1 and x2, uh, as well as the constant. So gamma one hat is the ordinary least square slope coefficient in front of x1 when you do the multiple regression of y on these variables, okay? On x1, x2 with the constant. So I say with the constant, uh, that's the default way to run the ordinary least square regression or to write down a linear model. Default way is to include this constant intercept and therefore the X vector that you're talking about in when you plug in the ordinary least square formula that include that uh, constant variable. But of course, it's not required that you have that constant in your model. You do not need to have that constant in your model. It entirely, it's entirely um, allowed or valid to assume your conditional mean model to not include that constant, that intercept term. And if you're estimating that model without the intercept term, then in your ordinary least square formula, the X vector will not include the constant variable one. Uh, but here, because we assume our conditional mean has this intercept, uh, then when we use ordinary least square to estimate the parameters, the X vector that you plug in in the ordinary least square formula will include this uh, one that what we call, that's what we call the constant variable. And when you take the model to Stata, you tell Stata to regress Y on X1, X2 without any um, modification to that command. Um, Stata will automatically, will by default add the intercept for you. Intercept is by default included, uh, but you can force it not to include it. So um, your TA can talk about that in the Stata session when you need it. All right, so, so that's a digress, but we were talking about how to estimate the conditional the conditional expected gender wage gap given the years of schooling, given the level of education. This is called conditional expected gender wage gap because we are conditioning on the years of education. All right, so now let's talk about one problem with that. One problem is with uh, this conditional expected gender wage gap that we talked about, uh, that we just found. Um, 
that conditional expected gender wage gap equals gamma one. Um, it doesn't vary with the schooling level. So basically, the model says that the gender wage gap among people with any schooling level is the same. So it's saying gender wage gap among college graduates is gamma one. Gender wage gap among high school graduate is gamma one. Gender wage gap among those who never had any, any education is gamma one. So, so the model that we assumed for the conditional mean of y given x1, x2 um, implies this conclusion, implies that the conditional expected gender wage gap doesn't vary with schooling. So the model, the model that we assumed is this, is conditional mean of y given x1, x2 is linear in x1 and x2. So that is an assumption that we made on one of the previous slides. That assumption that we make implies this conclusion, implies this is one of the implications. So this is one of the implication of our assumption. The implication is that the conditional gender wage gap, conditional expected gender wage gap at any schooling level is the same doesn't vary with schooling level. Well, you can argue whether this assumption, this, uh, uh, this is reasonable or not. Sometimes you might not think this is reasonable. Right? So maybe gender wage gap is not so different for uh, those who don't have any education. Maybe you think that uh, education will help to close up uh, gender wage gap in some way or maybe you think it's the other way around for some reason. Um, or maybe you think well, maybe um, white collar job is uh, more discriminating than blue collar job. Then clearly people with more education will go for white collar job more often. Um, and maybe because of that, the gender wage gap among higher, highly, more highly educated people is higher than those among people who are less educated. And that story will contradict this implication, will contradict this um, statement that conditional expected gender wage gap doesn't change with schooling level. Um, if you believe that um, the conditional expected gender wage gap should vary across schooling level, then this linear model would not be what you want to use. This model would not be consistent with your story. So in that case, you might want to consider making the model better. One way to make the model better is to consider an interaction term, meaning that a product random variable between x1 and x2, and include that on the right-hand side of your conditional mean model. So before, so in this model that we, was, uh, we were studying, um, conditional mean of y given x1, x2 is simply linear in x1 and x2. But that implies this conclusion, which may not be consistent with your view of the world, what you believe the world to be. Um, one way to make the model better, to make the model more consistent with what you think the model uh, the world is, is to add a nonlinear term like this. To add x1 times x2 into your regression. 
So now can this domain of y given x1, x2 is not a linear function of x1, x2, uh, but instead is this somewhat more complicated function with the interaction term. So this is called an interaction term. Um, so how do you add this interaction term in your model in practice? So in practice, you're gonna define a new random variable, say z, that equals x1 times x2. And you put this new random variable z here as another regressor, as another covariate. Uh, but because z is completely determined by x1, x2, you don't have to add z to this conditioning random variables. That's because given x1, x2, z is already given. There is no need to also write z. So no need to do that. So uh, what you are now allowing is this conditional mean of y given x1, x2 has this particular um, type of nonlinearity in x1 and x2. Okay, so that's mathematical details. What we really want to focus on is what the interaction term can tell us in addition to uh, the linear model, the completely linear model. So what can the interaction term do, right? Making this model more complicated will allow us to draw richer conclusions. And what are the richer conclusions we can draw from this more complicated conditional mean model? Now, to see what more complicated con conclusions we can draw, uh, let's again study the expected gender wage gap at x2 years of schooling. To do that, we just as before, we calculate the expected wage of a man with little x2 years of schooling according to this new model. Um, so we plug in x1 equals zero, which is the value for men, and little x2 here and zero for x1, little x2 for x2. Now, if you do the calculation, all the terms with zero will drop out. You're left with gamma zero plus gamma two, little x2. Right, so this gamma zero plus gamma, x, gamma two x2 is the expected wage of a man with little x2 years of schooling according to this model, according to this conditional mean model. On the other hand, the expected wage of a woman with little x two years of schooling is can also be obtained from this formula, except that you plug in one for the gender variable x one and little x two for x two and one for x one and little x two for x two. Now, if you do the calculation, you find this is exactly gamma zero plus gamma one plus gamma two little x two plus gamma three little x two. All right, so this is the expected wage of a woman with x two years of schooling. And this is the expected wage of a man with x two years of schooling. So what is the gender wage gap given x two years of schooling? That would be the difference between the two. And that's precisely these pink terms, gamma one plus gamma three times X two. So now the conditional expected gender wage gap given years of schooling is no longer constant, but instead varies with the years of schooling. And how do you estimate these for each level of schooling? Well, because you can estimate gamma one and gamma three by ordinary least square estimator, you can plug in those estimators 
and use that as an estimator for this conditional expected gender wage gap given schooling to be little x2. Uh, what is the ordinary square estimator here? The ordinary square estimator is the one where you regress y on this factor of regressors, where you added the interaction variable. All right, so, and I posted, um, I'm posting with the video, this um, Stata data set. Um, and with this data set, there are, in this data set, there are wage and there are education level, which is measured in years of schooling. And there is also gender and you can uh, run the regression in Stata that's calculating the ordinary square estimators for each of the three models, conditional mean models that we talked about um, today. And you can compare what you find for the gender wage gap from the three regressions. And this graph is what I find to be the, to be this, to be the gender wage gap as a function of schooling. So on the on this axis, that's gender wage gap. So conditional, conditional gender wage gap. So let's write the mathematics. Equals one, x2 equals little x2 minus expected value of y given x1 equals zero, x2 equals little x2. All right, so the y-axis is this conditional expected gender wage gap at a given schooling level. And on the x-axis, you have little x2, the schooling level. So what I have on the y-axis is an estimator of this, right? So it's an estimator of this. So I write a hat on top of this thing just to stand for an estimator of this whole thing. And that is gamma zero, uh, is it gamma zero? It's gamma one hat, gamma one hat plus gamma three hat uh, education. And I do a plot according to that data set, I find it's this uh, downward sloping curve. It looks like gamma three is negative meaning, and, and notice that the gender wage gap is negative, meaning that women are on average earning less than men at every schooling level. And the difference is higher for people who are more highly educated and lower for those who are less highly educated according to this model. Now, a useful summary of the gender wage gap at different levels of schooling is an average over schooling. By average, I mean taking expectation over the schooling random variable. As you see this gamma one plus gamma three times X two, that is the conditional gender wage gap at education level X two. Now you plug in the random variable X two, schooling random variable X two, you can take an expectation of this conditional gender wage gap. And that expectation turns out to be gamma one plus gamma three times E X two. And so this equation follows from the linearity of expectation operator. So expectation of sum equals sum of expectation and expectation of constant equals that constant. As you can see, this average in fact is the conditional gender wage gap at schooling level E X two which is the expected schooling level across the whole population, including both men and women. So this, in other words, can be also said to be the average difference or expected difference between the wage of men 
of schooling level equals the population expected value of schooling and women of schooling level of the same level. Now that average of conditional gender wage gap can be estimated in the following way. So it contains unknown parameters, gamma one, gamma three, and the expectation. We can estimate all three separately. So we can estimate gamma one, gamma three by the ordinarily square estimators, gamma one hat, gamma three hat. And we can estimate EX2 by the sample mean of X2 across um, the whole sample. So by Slutsky's theorem, this is a consistent estimator for that average conditional gender wage gap. Another useful summary of the gender wage gap by schooling is to average in a subpopulation, like averaging in the female subpopulation. That is taking the conditional expectation of the gender of the conditional gender wage gap by schooling, given that x1 equals 1, given that the person is female. When you do that, you find that equals gamma 1 plus gamma 3 times the conditional expectation of uh, education, x2, given female. So in other words, this is the conditional gender wage gap at the schooling level equals the average schooling level in the female population. Um, in other words, this is the expected wage difference between men at the schooling level equals the average schooling level of the female population and women at the same schooling level. And this clearly can also be estimated using the Slutsky theorem. You estimate gamma 1, gamma 3 by their ordinary square estimator from regressing y on x1, x2, and the interaction x1 times x2. And you can estimate this conditional expectation, which is the, uh, the expected education level in the female population. You can estimate that by the sample average of education level in the female subsample. And that is the mathematical formula for calculating the sample average for the subsample, for the female subsample. <clears throat> so this NF is the number of females in the sample. And this summation adds up all the education levels for the female, but it doesn't add in the education value for the male. Um, so this, why is this summation that? That's because we, in, we're summing up the product of x2 and x1, where x1 is only equal to one when the person is female and equals zero when the person is male. So when this is zero, this term doesn't enter, doesn't contribute to the summation. So that means the male education levels are, on, are not <clears throat> added in this summation. Only the female education is added in the summation. So that's why this is the sum of the female education divided by the number of females that gives you the average education level among the female sample. Now this quantity gets us closer to a decomposition, a kind of decomposition that is quite useful for studying discrimination. Using the model with the interaction term that we wrote down, so that's the model ey given x1, x2 equals gamma 0 plus gamma 1, x1 plus gamma 2, x2 plus gamma 3 interaction between x1 and x2. Using this model, we can arrive at a decomposition of the unconditional gender wage gap. So we can relate the unconditional gender wage gap to the conditional gender wage gap. So this is the unconditional gender wage gap, right? So this is, this is the unconditional gender wage gap. 
because we are not conditioning on expect uh, education in these expectations. And to figure out how this is related to the conditional gender wage gap, we're going to use this model. That's our assumed model for EY given education and um, and gender. According to this model, EY given x1 equals 1 equals so now we're going to use the law of iterated expectation. So that expectation equals expectation of y given x1 equals 1, x2 given x1 equals 1. So this is the conditional, conditional version of the law of iterated expectation. So what we are saying is taking average of y among the females is the same as first taking the average for each education level among the females and then average up the what you get for each education level again among females right so on both side in all the conditional expectations we have conditional on females so because we are focusing attention on females now um, but this expectation equals the this double expectation, iterated expectation, where the inside expectation is also conditional on schooling level. So this is the law of iterated expectation, conditional version. We went over this in, uh, in the first part of the course. And that according to this equation, we're going to plug in that equation. So, so for that, for this part, we're going to plug in this equation. We're plugging x1 equals 1. So x1 will become 1 and x2 will rem remain to be that x2 random variable. So that's gamma zero plus gamma one times one plus gamma two x two plus gamma three times one times x two given x one equals one. So let me use green here. Right, so, so what we did is to replace this conditional mean by this expression, which comes from our assumption for conditional mean of y given x1 and x2. So now the expectation is linear. So the expectation of the sum of different terms equals the sum of the expectation. So expectation, so that equals expectation of gamma zero given x1 equals one plus expectation of gamma one times one given x1 equals one, gamma one times one is gamma one plus expectation of gamma two x2 plus gamma um, given x1 equals one plus expected value of gamma three times one times x2 equals gamma three times x2, given x1 equals one. Um, so gamma zero and gamma one are constants. So expectation of them are still constant, are still themselves. So that's gamma zero plus gamma one. And this gamma two and gamma three are constant. Constant multiplier can come out of an expectation. So that's gamma two E X two given X one equals one plus gamma three E X two given X one equals one. Put the two terms together, factor out E X two given X one equals one. We get 
gamma zero plus gamma one plus gamma two plus gamma three times e x two given x one equals one. Right? So what we have found is conditional mean of y given x1 equals 1 can be written as gamma 0 plus gamma 1 plus gamma 2 plus gamma 3 times e x1 given uh, e x2, sorry. e x2 given x1 equals 1. So we have found this to, to be equal. And similarly, if you plug in x1 equals 0, if you are taking the conditional mean of y given x1 equals 0, then you go through the same procedure except this is 0. So that's zero, that's zero. And you plug in zero here and zero here. Everyone else, every other term is the same, but the one is replaced by zero. So you get gamma zero term stays the same with um, that, stays as this. So that's A gamma zero given X one equals zero. And this term doesn't exist because anything times zero is zero. And this term is the same as before, as the x1 equals 1 term. So that's e gamma 2x2 given x1 equals 0. And this term also disappears because when you plug in x1 equals 0, that part is disappears. So now what you're left with is gamma 0. There is no gamma 1 term plus gamma 2 ex2 given x1 equals 0, plus no gamma 3 term. So what you get is just gamma 0 plus gamma 2 times ex2 given x1 equals 0. So that's for ey given x1 equals 0. So to write it down, that should be gamma 0 plus gamma 2 e x2 given x1 equals 0. The previous page showed that the expected weight for female can be written in the notation of our conditional mean model with the interse interaction uh, as this can be written as a function of the gammas in that model in this way. And the expected weight of the male population can be written uh, in this way. So this is proved on the previous slide. And now we take the difference. We cancel out the gamma zero. And we write gamma one and gamma three times e x two x one plus uh, x two given x one equals one together. We write these two together in this orange term. And then we collect the gamma twos together. And we find the remaining term is gamma two times e x two given x one equals one minus e x two given x one equal to zero. So now we have separated or decomposed this unconditional gender wage gap into two components. This blue component, notice that it's gamma two times this education level difference between the female population and the male population. So this part is called the wage gap part, the part of the wage gap that is explained by education gap. Because this is explained due to the difference in the education level. If there is no education difference between the genders, then this term would be zero. Well, on the other hand, this orange part is the remaining wage gap that is not explained 
by education level. In descriptive language, this blue part, this is what you get when you compare an average man with the education level uh, that equals the female average education level and to an average man at edu education level at the male education level. So you are com so this term is the expected wage difference between two men, one with the education level at the female average education level and the other at the education level that is the male education level. Okay, so the difference between their wage is because they have different uh, education level. Well, this other term is what you get is the expected wage difference between two people. One person is um, a man with women's average education level and another is a woman with average women's education level. So the difference between the two random individuals you're comparing to get this expected difference is um, two people with the same education level but different genders. Well, here you're comparing two random individuals with the same gender but different education level. Clearly you can estimate the de decomposition using the method that we talked about. Um, the wage gap, the part of the wage gap caused by education gap can be estimated by gamma hat, gamma two hat times the sample difference, the difference between the average education level in the sample for female and male. So this is the average um, education level among the female sample, and this is the average education level among the male sample. And the, the remaining wage gap can be estimated by gamma one hat plus gamma three hat times X bar two F, which is the average education level for females in the sample. All right, so the last special topic that I want to go through in this class, in this lecture, is the consequence of misspecification in conditional mean model. So what is misspecification? Misspecification means wrong model. If your model is misspecified, that means your model is wrong. When you assume, when you make wrong assumptions, your model is wrong is misspecified. Uh, wrong model has consequences. Um, for example, if the model of round earth is wrong, then Mr. Magellan would have fall off the edge of the world. Well, for us in the linear conditional mean model, we can also talk about what is the implication of misspecification. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Let's come back to the simple linear conditional mean specification without the interaction term. Let's say we use this as our conditional mean model. We make the assumption, we assume that EY given X1, X2 is equal to this, equal to this completely linear function of X1, X2. This specification, this model assumption, can be wrong in several ways. For example, it may be that the conditional mean of y given x1, x2 truly contain the interaction term, but our model assumption excludes that. Then what's the consequence of that? The consequence of that is that we miss the rich variation of the conditional expected gender wage gap related to schooling level. We simply draw the misleading conclusion that gender wage gap doesn't vary with schooling, even though in truth, maybe it does. And if, we, if the true model contains the interaction term, but we do not 
used, we exclude the interaction term, then our estimate for gamma one for the coefficient of x one would also be inconsistent. So it's possible that the gamma one hat we get from regressing y only on one x one x two. Um, so that gamma one. It's possible that estimate that we get is a conditional expected gender wage gap at some schooling level, but because we did not estimate the full model with the interaction term, we do not know which one. We do not know what we are estimating. We do not know what gamma one had converges to. So the interpretation of the coefficients becomes unclear. Another possibility, another um, possible misspecification happens when the true conditional mean contains a nonlinear term of one of the variables, say x2. So maybe in truth, in the real world, EY expected wage given gender and education is a quadratic function of education instead of a linear function of education. So in the true model, the conditional expected gender wage gap given schooling is gamma one. It doesn't vary with schooling. Um, so, so the interpretation, so, uh, so this model if we, if the true model is this with the square of the schooling, um, but we are not including this, does that still affect our estimation of conditional expected gender wage gap? It still does, even though in truth, even though in the true model, the conditional gender wage gap doesn't vary with schooling and the model we estimate also doesn't vary with schooling. Um, so we're not missing anything in terms of how expected gender wage gap vary with schooling. However, we still uh, have a problem because we are not able to estimate the gamma one consistently if we ignore the square term when the square term is in fact there in truth. Uh, suppose we miss the square term, but instead run a regression of y only on x1, x2, not the square term. Then our gamma one hat, the coefficient on x1, is not consistent for gamma one. So missing x2 actually give us an inconsistent estimator for the conditional expected gender wage gap. So why is it uh, inconsistent? Why is it not consistent? Well, to see why we can let u equals y minus the conditional mean of y given x1, x2. Okay, so u is the difference between y and the conditional mean of y given x1, x2. And because the true formula for this conditional mean is the one including the square term. So actually it is minus sign here. So there is a minus sign here between x1 and gamma two. Okay, so because in truth, the true form for the conditional mean of y given x1, x2 is this expression, including the square term. So u equals y minus this true form of the conditional mean. But suppose we let u star be u plus the square term. Then 
the model, the linear model we are estimating is in fact this one. The linear model we are trying to estimate is by regressing y only on x1, x2, not the square term. So we are in our estimation, we are ignoring the x2 term. So our model is actually y equals gamma zero plus gamma one x1 plus gamma two x2 plus u star, where u star equals u plus the omitted square term. For this model, there will be correlation between u star and x2, as well, as well as correlation between u star and x1. So this model doesn't satisfy the orthogonality condition. And therefore, by regressing y on x1, x2, we get an estimator of gamma one hand, but it's not a consistent estimator for gamma one. So th what this sentence says is, the error term u star for this needs to satisfy the orthogonality condition in order for our OLLS estimator for the coefficient of x1 to be consistent for gamma one. But unfortunately, orthogonality condition is not satisfied for this model because u star is not orthogonal to the x variables. How do we see that? Remember, recall that u star is u plus, so it's gamma here, u plus gamma three x two squared. And u is ey, sorry, u is y minus ey given x one x two. Now e x one times u star equals e x one times u plus gamma three times e x one times x two squared E x one times u is not a problem, that will be zero. And the reason for that is we proved in lecture one, week nine, that u, which is expected value, a y minus expected value of y given x one, x, x two, U by definition satisfies this. It's mean independent of x1 and x2. We can prove it again here. So EU given x1, x2 equals EY minus EY given x1, x2 given x1, x2. And that equals EY given x1, x2. So that's simply because this expectation can be distributed to each of these two terms. So the first term will yield ey given x1, x2. The second term will yield e of this conditional mean given x1, x2. And E of this conditional mean given x1, x2 equals itself because this is a function of x1, x2 and given x1, x2 that the value of that function is constant, is given non-random. So taking expectation doesn't do anything. So expectation will be, so taking the conditional expectation will not do anything. So conditional expectation of that equals itself. So that equals EY given X1, X2 minus EY given X1, X2. So the reason for that is given X1, X2, this, this function of X1, X2 is no longer random. And therefore that is zero. <clears throat> so by definition of u, eu given x1, x2 should be zero. Uh, 
And we also know from week three that mean independence implies orthogonality, which we also call linear independence, which says EX one times U equals zero. Okay, so mean independence implies orthogonality. So this part is not a problem. So that part equals zero. Therefore, E X one U star equals only this part. So that's gamma three, forgot to change. Okay. But this term is typically not zero unless gamma three equals zero. If gamma three is not zero, we would need this to be zero, but this is typically not zero because X1 gender, X2 education are typically related. And in fact, this is typically positive because X1 is always zero or one and X2 square is always positive. So this is typically not zero. And therefore E X1 times U star is typically not zero unless gamma three equals zero. So what does gamma three equals zero mean? It means the true model actually doesn't include the square term. If the true, if the true model include the square term, gamma three is not zero, then U star and X1 are not orthogonal. So that is not zero, okay? So typically this is not zero. So orthogonality condition is not satisfied for the model that we estimate, okay, which is misspecified because we missed the square term. And because the orthogonality condition is not satisfied, our uh, estimator for gamma one is not consistent. All right. Um, so what are the solutions to potential misspecification? Clearly, if you are missing some terms, you are misspecified, you get misleading conclusions or you get inconsistent estimators, then what's the solution? The obvious solution is to add nonlinear terms. Of course, the difficult question is what nonlinear terms to add. Um, well, there are some guidance from practice, for example, interaction. So sometimes whenever you suspect that um, the way that Y varies with one variable is related to another variable, related to the level of another variable, you should add the interaction term. What about nonlinear terms like square terms? For those, there are typically some convention, like when you have um, a wage equation when Y is wage, and when you include experience as one of the X variables, then including a square term is often reasonable because wage doesn't increase indefinitely with experience. It does um, flat out after a while. So, um, and for in conventional, in conventionally, the square term of years of schooling is um, not added. Typically, we don't use square term of schooling. Um, but for education, sometimes people believe that sheepskin effect is often important, meaning that having a college degree is important, independent of number of schooling. So whether you finished uh, four years of college or you only did three years uh, can make a difference, right? So um, the average wage difference between those with four years of college and three might be bigger than the average difference between um, those with three years of college and two years of college. So in that case, you might want to consider adding a dummy variable, a dummy variable that equals one if the person has four years of college rather than less than four years. Um, you might want to include that in, the, in addition to the number of schooling. Um, 
and that will give you a kind of nonlinearity as well. So in other contexts is um, not uncommon to just try different terms until your estimator or the quantity that you are interested in kind of stabilizes. Okay, so it's not uncommon to try adding different nonlinear terms and see what happens to the quantity you want to estimate. If adding a term makes a huge difference, then that probably means you should add that term. That probably means that the model without that term was misspecified. 